Hey, welcome everybody. Greg Bendian here with the Progcast. And today I have a, a wonderful guest that I have not seen in a little while. But someone that I'm uh, very happy to see and a musician that I've done quite a bit of collaboration with. He's one of my favorite guitar players, but he's also a great composer and a music conceptualist. And I think one of the uh, founding figures in the genre of world fusion with his work in the group Shadow Facts. Uh, welcome, my friend G.E. Stinson. Thank you for having me, Greg. It's great to talk to you and see you. See you in person via Zoom, which is kind of great because I don't see people right now. <laughs> That's quite an introduction. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. It's all verifiable. <laughs> well, coming from you, that's even more appreciated, though, because we've played together quite a bit, and it's always been fun and also challenging because you're a monster. <laughs> well, we've certainly uh, pushed each other in different directions musically. And we'll yep. get into that. Obviously, uh, I want to talk to you about our stuff, but also all the other great stuff that you've done. I'm a little curious about your time on the Chicago scene, because I know that you bridge that moment in transition from the 60s to the 70s, where people are, are either doing psychedelia, uh, psych rock, or the blues before transitioning into what's, which I guess we could call jazz rock. And, uh, and I know that you are uh, a serious fan and, and practitioner, or certainly were of the blues. So could you tell us uh, like a little bit about what that Chicago scene is like in the 60s moving into the 70s? Oh yes, that's a, that's a very rich subject. And Actually, interesting that you bring up psych rock, um, that whole thing, because those things were happening simultaneously in my life and in my music. I was intensely immersed in blues. I mean, the reason I started playing guitar was because of Bo Diddley. He was the first guitar player that I heard, and the minute I heard what he was doing, I wanted to be able to do that. I had this really strong desire to be able to, do, to try to do that, do whatever, whatever it was he was doing. I come from a family of gospel musicians. My mother was a piano player, so, but guitar was not automatic, but I asked her to buy me guitar and she did. And um, I immediately immersed myself in blues and Bo led me to Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf and all those guys. And, and this was kind of before, just on the cusp of the whole Brit invasion, Beatles, Rolling Stones thing. <clears throat> I can remember listening to that music and having friends say, well, why are you listening to that? That's not very cool, you know? <laughs> and they were listening to the Beach Boys, which I had nothing against the Beach Boys, but that was not my thing, you know? But, you know, it's funny. I, so I immer immersed myself in it and really delved into it and, and tried to learn how to play this well as I could just listening to the records you know because you at, at that age I didn't have access to the people themselves which I would later in you know, several years I'd be friends with those people um, but also at the same time almost simultaneously the Brit invasion came and I immediately plugged into the bands that uh, some of the bands that where those things kind of merged, you know, the Beatles were doing kind of R and B and then kind of transformed into this very revolutionary psychedelic kind of thing. And also the Yardbirds, these were two pivotal bands. The Yardbirds started out as basically a blues R and B band and then became this like crazy psychedelic innovative band. So in my world, those things existed simultaneously. And in Chicago in the 60s and early 70s was a wide open space musically. It was, there was everything happening simultaneously and it was kind of great. You know, you could go to a concert and I mean, we played, one of the bands I was in played a concert opening for B.B. King and, and 10 Years After. 
Wow. We were the first band, the band I was in was called Fatwater, and we were kind of a heavy, kind of heavy rock blues group, you know, although we did have kind of psychedelic elements at times. Like I had, I wrote a song called Golden Horse, which was a, a totally psychedelic kind of like acid inspired piece, you know. But then we would turn around and do the Ballad of Hollis Brown by Bob Dylan, like a heavy, crunchy version of it. So that 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 whole the whole atmosphere of Chicago was really fertile and open, and everything was happening simultaneously, you know. And it was fantastic. I mean, I could go to, um, for instance, go to Willie Dixon's house where he would be teaching us songs, you know, and then. Several days later, I go to see Jefferson Airplane playing free in Grant Park. You know, it was like that. It was it was an incredible time. I think a, a time of well music. Uh, sorry, any good Willie Dixon stories? Oh yeah, the, like the best story ever was going to one of the first times we went to his house, and um, our band had a record deal at the time. And he wanted us to do one of his songs. And so he was going to teach us to, to do the song. And he had Lafayette Leak. And a lot of people don't know Lafayette. Lafayette was a brilliant piano player. Any piano you hear on a chess recording that's not Otis Spann or Sunnyland Slim, it's Lafayette Leak. He's doing all the stuff on Otis, um, on, I mean, uh, on a, uh, like Bo Diddley, on Chuck Berry, all that stuff. That's all Lafayette. He's brilliant. And he was Willie's sidekick. So he was there on a Wurlitzer piano. Willie sat down and he started playing the song for us, right? <laughs> and he's singing in Lafayette's planet. Now, Willie, before he starts, he picks up a brown paper bag and puts it on his lap and starts playing time on it. on the paper bag, right? And it was all I could do to not just like sort of stop dead in my tracks to listen to what he was playing on a paper, on the paper bag. Because uh, it was astonishing. I mean, all the subtlety that was going on. It was like, you know what I mean? It was something that who would ever do this now? No one would ever, ever even think of doing. And when we left, uh, the bass player walked, we walked outside and, and he looked at me and he said, did you hear that? And I said, yeah, man, it's unbelievable. <laughs> and the funny thing was that the, the, the singer and the drummer, they're going, what are you guys talking about? And they didn't, but it, this guy, the bass player was Don Cody, who was an incredible musician and would end up being a recording engineer. He engineered the Tony Bennett um, Tony Bennett, Bill Evans record. Oh yeah. Don was super plugged in. He's the guy who turned me on the miles, for instance, the bitches brew and turned me on the bitches brew. We just sat there flabbergasted listening to Willie Dixon playing time on a pa brown paper bag. And it was, I've said at times, this was the deepest, one of the deepest lessons in music I have ever received in my entire life. Cause you don't need, any fancy instruments. <laughs> if you have that thing, you know, like Willie had, I mean, he was just, he just oozed music. You know? He was, he was so, amazing. Like the feel of, of what he was doing rhythmically is what you're saying. Yeah. And the subtlety, all the little things he was playing. He was doing it like he had a drum kit. And singing at the, oh, there's a rock in the wind going on at the same time. You know, it was, it was mind blowing. It was awesome. Wow. So did you go to, to the uh, checkerboard lounge? Was that around? Did you go to, Je to blues clubs? The checkerboard round, lounge wasn't open yet. Um, the people would go to Teresa's or um, Pepper's. And I used to go to Pepper's. And um, it was, a, it was a, a fascinating, but could be quite dangerous inside. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I saw some 
I saw, actually, I saw Junior Wells pull a knife on someone in there, in the kitchen, in there. It was a terrifying experience. <laughs> yeah. Yep. It got real. It got very real, very fast. Uh, fortunately, there was this older woman. I have, I have forgotten her name. She was, she was the cook there. And she, um, when she saw Junior do that, she picked up a meat cleaver. And said, Junior, you better stop acting like a fool. I'm going to put this in your head. You know? <laughs> and everyone knew this woman and knew that, that she was not messing around and that she probably would have done it. And he got very contrite very rapidly. He was a little drunk. I think it was a lot of bluster and alcohol. You know? But, you know, it's weird. You, know? you don't often see people. I had never seen anyone pull an iPhone. It was very pretty weird you know the, the the one run in i had with junior wells believe it or not was when i was playing in chicago with Derek bailey oh whoa and, yeah and somebody said let's go to the checkerboard lounge tonight and Derek said uh well, maybe for a few songs yeah so we get Derek and 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 his girlfriend karen to go to the checkerboard and it's Magic Slam's night, mm. but but Junior is taunting him from from the bar, <laughs> and and he says, "You're just a bigfoot motherfucker," and and they and he's looking to start a fight with him, and it's, and you talk about that danger feeling, you know, it's like stuff was about to just bust out, and so at. At the break, we're kind of waiting to see what's going to happen. Magic Slim disappears. So I go over to Junior and ask if I can get a picture with him. And he says to me, $5. And I had no, no compunction, no compunction whatsoever about giving him a $5 bill and getting my picture with Junior Wells, which I have to this day. So, but I mean, that's a, that was a really funny moment because you talk about things being very real. I mean, it was definitely, we were the only white people in the place and nobody was giving us a hard time. Yeah. Um, how, how accepting were the blues musicians of you guys? Oh, amazing. They were great. I mean, there was always, there was always a, the, the rare exception, but almost every, every one of the guys that I met and knew and befriended were all just the most wonderful. I can't say enough about them. You know, they were generous, kind, loving. I mean, I became lifelong friends with some of them. You know, I hadn't seen Willie in years and ran into him in Los Angeles and thought he wouldn't even remember me, but he did. I was stunned, you know, that he remembered me. And, you know, all those guys, B.B. King, we opened, B.B. King was like, I mean, he was B.B. King. You know, I met him. I had already idolized the man. And when I came off stage, he was standing there. And he came up to me and he said, nice playing, young gentleman. And I was, and I was so stunned. I, didn't even, I couldn't even respond. <laughs> you know, I was just like, and Don, the bass player, said, say something. <laughs> I said, thank you, and shook his hand. I mean... Those guys are, those, those, they're, most of them, you know, 99% of them are beautiful, wonderful human beings. And then occasional resentful, you know, and angry guys. And that's understandable to me. Uh, the, the society that they grew up in and things they endured, you know. And I, I witnessed some of that. But they were all, they were all amazing. It was a different time. It was so different because there, there weren't the kind of constrictions on, what you could do that there are now you know now you're not you're not allowed to do certain things which you know has an upside and downside you know it was a very free time for some of us you know not for others so what is the transition for you do you do you hear bitches brew and that sort of a light goes off or what what is the moment yeah there were several like light bulbs, and I should say like, you know, major light bulb moments. 
Bitches Brew was one of them. Uh, hearing Jethro Tull live, which I had never heard, I hadn't heard them. Um, hearing Dave Brubeck on record, like the, the Take Five era, you know, and hearing that music and not really understanding what was going on with it. Also hearing Charlie Parker and thinking, what is this guy doing? And sitting, I remember I sat down and learned like the head of Lundito you know, on guitar, which I'm not educated, so I had to actually do it note by, for note with the LP. So there were these different moments. Bitches Brew was massive, was a major moment. And I, like many of those major moments, I didn't really understand what it was when I first heard it, you know. But all I knew was, oh, there's grooves going on. This is so cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then what's all this other stuff, you know? But there was kind of that, I could latch into that, being coming from the blues R&B scene, the groove thing totally, that hooked me, you know? And then I, can't, uh, I cannot under us, understate the effect of seeing Jethro Tull live and how suddenly, oh, these guys are doing like jazzy stuff, you know, like, and this was the first tour they did of the States. They were opening for Led Zeppelin. And, and I had gone to see Led Zeppelin. I didn't know who Jethro Tull was. You know? And suddenly I just had my whole musical world shattered. I mean, hearing these guys do these songs, you know, and that band was Glenn Cornick and Clyde Bunker, Martin Barr, that was an incredible band. They, they could play almost anything, those guys. They were fantastic. That was mind blowing. So there are several moments like that, you know, yeah. Did, were you aware but, of? Hey, sorry. Seeing Ornette Coleman's quartet live, 1968 in Chicago with my buddy, Mike Rasfeld. He said, oh, Ornette Coleman's coming, let's go see them. And I didn't, I sort of knew who Ornette was, but I wasn't really plugged into him. And it was him, Dewey Redmond, Charlie, and um, uh, Ed Blackwell. And it, once again, it was the, this moment of listening to music and going, what the hell is going on here? And being completely fascinated by the fact that I knew nothing about what was happening and intrigued and challenged and wanting to find out what it was that was happening. You know, it's such a fundamental attitude when you're a creative musician is enjoying the not knowing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right? become a, a, a part of every aspect of my life. I mean, in Zen Buddhism, that's the whole thing, not knowing. You know, there's a famous koan, you know, a monk goes on a pilgrimage and he comes to the master and the master says, what is the point of your pilgrimage? He says, I don't know. He says, not knowing is most intimate. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I, I still enjoy it. Uh, hearing something that I just said, what's going on here? You know, um, right. I, I always remember it taking two or three listens to uh, say the new Holdsworth or something like that before I even understood what the forms were or anything, you know? Right. Um, but what were you aware of John McLaughlin's work before Bitches Brew? No, I was not. That was the first time I ever heard him was on. And it was kind of mind blowing to hear somebody playing like that in that setting, in the way he was playing because it was an instantly intriguing to me, you know, and there, cause there were elements you could hear in it that I didn't really understand. But there were other aspects of the kind of rock vibe that he had where I was like, wow, you know, I could latch onto that, but that there was the beginning of those Indian influences that were in there, you know, where you were like, wow, what is that? You know? And I, you know, I had, the other thing that was happening at this time was, um, the whole Indian music thing. That was a big thing for me. I started studying how to play sitar, sitar, you know, and I was listening to Ravi. And I mean, that came to, through the Beatles and through the Yardbirds, this whole interest in Asian and Indian music. You know? And uh, so 
I heard what he was doing, but I didn't put it together. You know what I mean? Until years later, after Mahavishnu, and I, and I heard um, the Yehudi menu and Ravi Shankar record, West meets East. And I went, oh my God, this is where a lot of that Mahavishnu, where the inspiration comes from, comes from this record. I mean, it's all in there. A lot of it is in there, you know, the, the lick trading, the, these incredible modal elements, you know. And that, was, that became a hugely important record for me. Yehudi Menuhin and Ravi Shankar. Yeah, and I was trying to learn how to play sitar in, in the wasteland of the Midwest, which was impossible. Was there a teacher? No teachers, no way. <laughs> there was an Indian shop um, in the neighborhood I lived in, which is, I think, where I bought the sitar, you know? And, um, and the guy who lived in there, I mean, worked there and owned it, encouraged me. And he would, you know, like, he would tell me little things. He said, well, you know, the sitar players, they use sandalwood oil on their fingers to make it slide easier. And, oh, okay, cool. You know, that's how I, and I would just listen and try and imitate it. You know? I never got the subtlety that you would get from a teacher. You know, a teacher would tell you, oh, you can hear it in like Harrison's playing because he's not super adept, but he has a certain kind of subtlety to his bends that are really amazing. You know? But it was, it was almost impossible. There, were, there was like nothing going. You know who helped me was Colin Walcott. Oh. With little tips and advice, you know, I would, when he would come into town and say, I'm having a problem with you know, like keeping my tuning, keeping this thing in tune. He said, yeah, just put chalk on the pegs, you know, put chalk on the pegs and then stick, and they'll stick better. I was like, I didn't know that. I had no idea, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, Colin was, I mean, I didn't get a chance to study with him. That would have been great, but he wasn't. Chicago was not, um, that's why we were kind of groundbreaking in terms of our world music exploration. That wasn't really happening there too much. It was much more happening in New York. Yeah. But it's happening and, and it reaches you guys and, and almost like in your isolation, you're dealing with it in your own way. Yeah, which I think is why Shadow Facts became so singular in terms of what we were doing, because we were isolated and we didn't know what we were doing. We were just kind of like, well, that's cool. Let's try to do that, you know? And we were, you know, like, um, Shadow Facts was really about, like, bringing all these different elements together, all the, the free improv, the crazy rock stuff we loved, some jazzy elements, the odd time signatures like Du Brubeck was doing, you know, which I loved. I loved all those compositions he was doing with all those odd times, you know. They were fascinating to me, you know. And then to hear Weather Report in Oregon. Now these guys are they're like several years ahead of us. And then Mahavishnu, you know, and you're like, holy crap. You know? And so we were just, we were just, we were trying to absorb everything that was a kind of opening up at that time and just channeling it in our own way you know we used to have these listening sessions where people would you know like bring in the none such explorer record that they bought that week you know javanese gamelan or whatever or japanese kodo music or pygmy music from africa you know you just sit around like listening to this stuff completely fascinated and trying to figure out a way to folded into the music, you know, which was weird because, of course, we have also had all these other, you know, like elements, like, you know, classical music and stuff. So it became such a mishmash, you know, such a, a hybrid, of all these different things. We were also listening to, I mean, I was listening to Schoenberg and Webern and Bartok and a lot of the, like, Elliot Carter and Warrenen, I think is, um, and um, yeah. George Rochberg, for instance, you know, who I loved, I adored him. You know. So we were trying to make all that stuff work in a band, you know, where we were playing really loud to orange amplifiers. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Well, I, I'm, I'm really happy to hear you mention 
Nonsuch Explorer because of course it was huge for me as well. And I think it's a foundational element of so many of the creative musicians that I have worked with. You know, you're not the first person on the podcast to mention the Nonsuch Explorer series. And I had the wonderful experience of meeting Jack Holtzman, who was the guy that started Electra Asylum and, and who discovered the doors. But when I met him, I thanked him for Nonsuch Explorer. And he said to me, you know, of all the things I've done, that's the thing I'm most proud of. Wow. Yeah. But and and that was that was like an astonishing achievement and so influential in such an underground way. I mean, most people have no idea the impact that that series had on so many musicians, you know. I mean, literally, you know, how are you gonna get to Japan to hear Koto music? Well, here it is, you know. How are you gonna get to Java to hear Gamelon or Balinese music, you know, or Africa? But here it is, here you can put on a record and there it is. And it, and it's, and it was mind blowing every single time. Every one of those records is a treasure. It's just an astonishing treasure, you know. We had, I think I had, between everyone in the band, we had every one of those records. Yeah. So. You had to have them all. Yeah. Well, and, and then anything else. And fortunately, other people took that idea and went further with it or did other things with it, like the Okora records. I don't remember those. I think it was a French label. They did a lot of Middle Eastern recordings, some astonishing stuff. Really, really great, you know. And then I started to meet musicians like we were, a friend of ours at the time was Adam Rudolph, you know, the incredible percussionist. And Adam was at that time had already been to Africa and met Fode Musususo, and and he came back and he was. They started a band in Chicago called the Mandingo Grio Society, and we used to do double bills with them, Shadow Facts and the Mandingo Grio Society which was amazing. I mean, I can't even imagine what that would have been like to listen to because mm. both bands were louder than God <laughs> doing the weirdest music you can possibly imagine. I mean, you can imagine, right? Electric Cora, you know, it was, it was, it was incredible. Yeah. So it was great. You know, like, so I, and I, I got exposed to a lot of music through Adam and especially later the second period when he was playing in Shadow Effect. Yeah for a bit. Had you guys seen Hendrix? Um, I never saw Hendrix. I don't know that anyone in the band saw Hendrix, no. But Hendrix was clearly a huge influence on everyone. I mean, undeniable, you know, massive influence on everyone. You know, at the, I didn't, it was like, that was just sort of a given that Hendrix was an influence on everyone, you know. For me, Electric Ladyland is one of the most astonishing records ever done. You know? So, yeah. I mean, I always like to say uh, that Hendrix is one of the first fusion musicians. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, he was, there was no question that he was, whether he was aware of it or not, was all about like knocking barriers down, like bringing things together and in totally amazing ways. And you know, it's funny because I think of Hendrix and the Yardbirds in, in a very similar way. Um, although they came from a completely different points of view, one being an English band and him being an American musician, you know, but they both arrived at this kind of intense psychedelic openness at around the same time. I was just thinking about the uh, Yardbird song happening 10 year time ago. You know this song happening 10 years time ago? Sure. That was released in 1966. Yeah. I saw the Yardbirds that year in Chicago at the Civic Opera House, I believe it was. And it was both Jeff Beck and Jimmy Page in the band at that time. Was and Page playing bass? He played bass for part of the gig and then played yeah. guitar for part of the gig. They actually did a song where they traded solos called Psycho Daisies, right? They traded solos, but mostly it was Beck's show, you know. The next year I saw them in St. Louis and Beck was gone and it was just Paige. And that was the beginnings of Led Zeppelin, really. 
But yeah, I mean, I was just thinking about this because I was, I've been sort of reviewing some music from that period and thinking about what else was happening. And I was, the Rolling Stones released Between the Buttons, which was also a great record. The Stone, I mean, the Beatles were working on Sgt. Pepper, releasing Sgt. Pepper the same year, The Happening Stenuous Time. I, I go, if you listen to that song now and think about the time, it's a remarkably astounding thing that that happened at all. It's literally the first time I ever heard a guitar noise break in a song. It, there it is. I mean, if you don't count, I'm a man <laughs> with the crazy shit. But yeah, I mean, those, those elements, I mean, the elements of openness, exploration, extended technique, all, whatever you want to call it, bringing these weird elements in that don't necessarily, hadn't been there before. Yeah, Hendrix, Yardbirds, Beatles, all those guys, you know, they were super influential. Yeah, absolutely. And like Hendrix, uh, Third Stone from the Sun. Astonishing. I think of, um, yeah, that's an astonishing, <laughs> that's, you know, you have like Wes Montgomery aspects in there, you know, and then it's just completely like, where are we at now? You know, it's, it's amazing. You know, it's almost like Miles just couldn't help it. You know, he heard that. Yeah. And, you know, he knew he wanted to change. And Hendrix comes along and he's doing all of these different things, you know, even even there with that swing feel on on third. Yeah. Stone. Yeah. yeah. And and then uh, and then here comes John McLaughlin, who's on the blues scene and the jazz scene and the free scene and the studio scene and you know you have that versatility and then bitches brew well obviously uh silent way first but you know lifetime is is so much a response to hendrix yeah did you see them i never saw them live but um n never saw lifetime live which i regret so much because that band had such a direct impact on, on me and on Shadow Effects, because at the time that that record, those records came out, the first, uh, the first Lifetime record, not you know the, the one with McLaughlin and Larry Young, we had a, a drummer, Billy Salter, who was studying with Jack Dijonet, right? And Billy adored Tony Williams. <clears throat> Billy was an African-American guy. He lived on the south side of Chicago, was studying with Dijonet, and was an incredible jazz drummer. Really, really good. Um, our relationship didn't work out, but it, it became an amazing sort of cross-fertilization because he'd never played the kind of raucous, loud shit that we were doing, right? But he had all this kind of, all that Tony, like all the polyrhythmic, you know, stuff, and he and I, literally, we would just be in the studio together um, in our rehearsal space for two hours on end, just playing those, those, that stuff. You know, just riffing, just improvising on that stuff. I learned so much from him during that period. I'd love to find him and thank him for it, because it was, because he was just a master of like, turning it over. <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> and I was like, it became just so much fun to do that stuff. And we would just pour over those records. And he had every Miles record that existed. You know, he would he would actually practice to those records, you know. And so I got exposed to a lot of earlier Miles stuff, which I hadn't heard, like Feed to Killing Manjaro and those things, you know, through him. That was a great experience. Well, I, I definitely want to talk about Shadow Facts, but I also think I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you, you're in Chicago, how, how aware are you of the Avant Jazz scene and the AACM and those kinds of guys in Chicago at that time? Um, you know, in the 70s, it, it, it was like, it was kind of funny because it was seeping in from the outside, right? And, but the art ensemble and the AACM guys were there all the time. I mean, 
Obviously, our ensemble had been in Paris in 69 or whatever it was. But, I mean, the presence of the AACM was there. You know, you couldn't miss them. And I lived in Hyde Park at one point, which is was like next door to where they were, you know. So, you know, I, I was probably seeing those guys without knowing who they were. You know what I mean? Because Chicago in the 60s, late 60s, was a very small town. The creative community was small. It wasn't a huge, a big place like it is now. So, and I was already exposed to Ornette. So I was beginning to hear these things and once again, not really understanding what was going on. I can't remember when I heard, for instance, um, People in Sorrow. Um, probably around 74, 73, something like that, which was three years after it came out, I think, or after they did it, three or four years after it came out. But I remember listening to it thinking, what is this? And how do I get to understand, how do I, how can I get to the meat of what this is about and understand it? And I was, perplexed, um, confused, challenged, interested, intrigued, you know, because it was, that was really beyond anything. I mean, there was nowhere, the only way into that music for me were all these percussive elements, which were, okay, this is a world music kind of element, you know what I mean? So that was a way in where, and I'd heard Ornette, you know, in 68. So I, and I understood, I mean, I, you know, like we had a, Chuck Greenberg was our sax player and he worshiped uh, Coltrane. You know? So I heard all the Coltrane stuff. So, you know, it was there and it was sort of like, how would I describe it? The backdrop to everything in a way, seeping in, because no ever, you know, you could walk down to the park near in Lake Michigan in Hyde Park and those guys would be in the park playing, jamming and stuff. They'd be just hanging around jamming in the park. It was kind of crazy, you know? It's, a, it's as you say, that the time period is so open and we were spoiled rotten. I mean, <laughs> in, New York, in New York, we had Soundscape and we had the public theater and, and these were the venues for those guys when they came from Chicago, when the black artist group guys came from St. Louis right. and, and we were able to, to experience, you know, all the various Julius Hemphill projects. Right. And the, you know, all the different Braxton projects and Muhal and, and all those guys. And, and then eventually I was able to study with Steve McCall, which was a huge thing for me. Incredible. I, one of my favorite drummers of all time. One of the most musical, beautiful, astonishing drummers of all time. So under, under acknowledged, in my opinion, just a genius drummer. I have to agree. <laughs> and, uh, you know, knowing that he was respected by guys like Jack DeJanette, which we, you know, who we all love, was, was meant a lot because, you know, Jack knew what was up. But outside of air, I don't think a lot of people knew what Steve was about. He had a great sense of humor. And I think that was in his playing too. You know, the, the, the humorous aspect of some of those guys in the music was super important because it, it was another, like you say, the percussion, but also I think the humor was a yeah. thing that could draw you in. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was very humanistic music. It was very human. I mean, there was something in there. I mean, in almost every art ensemble record, there'd be some point where I'd be just laughing my ass off. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, and, and that, was, that was totally amazing. Man. It was totally great. Yeah, I, I, man, Air, and, and Threadgill has gone on to become just one of the most astonishing composer, leader, musicians of all time, in my opinion. I love, I adore. You know, I, I got to do a, a little, what go to a little talk sort of interaction he did at UCLA not long ago, which was really fascinating. Amazing, amazing guy, amazing guy. Yeah, it, it was a great trio. Uh, and Fred Hopkins is an underrated bass player. Absolutely. And I, I, you know, I had the, the great pleasure of playing in a trio with him and Peter Brotsman. 
Oh, what? whoa, wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, I think maybe even before we had the trio with William Parker, Grotzman and I had, had a, a, a bunch of gigs with Fred Hopkins on bass, which were recorded and I have in my archive. And I'd always wanted to play with Fred, of course, having been a, you know, a protege of Steve's uh, McCall. And, uh, and it was everything I'd hoped for, you know? Yeah, yeah. I can imagine. He was amazing. That, that's one of my favorite trios of all time. Well, Anything by Jimmy Jufri and Air. <laughs> right, like the Paul Blay, Swallow, Jufri, and... Oh, uh, my God. Jim Hall and uh, yeah, great stuff. So, how does this all figure in to Shadow Facts? What is the genesis of Shadow Facts? Um, you know, literally, it's it's that moment when um, I had been doing you know rock and blues and had been quite successful in Chicago as a rock blues guy, you know. Um, at one point, you know, like it seemed that, that, that obvious that I would just continue doing that. And then I heard these other musics and decided I, I needed to do something else. I just needed to, um, I needed to do more. I was just intrigued by this music that I didn't understand. And so I basically sort of said to Chuck Greenberg, who was the horn player that I would I was friends with at the time. He used to play on some of our blues gigs, you know. Um, I said, you know, I want to start a, an instrumental band, um, just doing like sort of stuff I've never done before. You know, I want to incorporate some of these elements that, you know, I have never explored before. And I began composing pieces, you know, you know, teaching myself to write, compose in, in odd time signatures and stuff. And working on that to where the point, and it was, I mean, it was hard work. You know, I really spent a lot of time shedding that writing and playing in odd times to the point to where it didn't feel weird, it felt natural. And it was weird, it was interesting for us because we were all kind of not, highly educated musicians. So we had to teach ourselves how to do it. And, but in a way it was not hard because you could just shed, you just began to play the music, just play the music, you know? And, and this was also the period when we would begin improvising as a kind of way, as a reservoir of ideas, just start playing and see what happens, you know? And we brought uh, Stuart Nevitt up from, he was in Miami. He was studying the University of Miami at the time. And he became the, the drummer. And, and, and Doug Malachny came from New Jersey to, to be the keyboard player. And they all brought different elements into the music that, you know, like, for instance, Doug had a lot of Keith Jarrett kind of feeling to him, you know that kind of like beautiful kind of harmonic complexity. You know? And so, you know, we were just trying, trying to do something we had never done before, you know, but, you know, during that period, it's hard to understate how it was, it was in how open everything was in terms of the music, how, it, it didn't seem weird to say, oh, well, we can draw on Indian music and we can draw on classical music, we can draw on medieval music, we can draw on rock music, we can draw on blues and put it all together and just make it work <laughs> somehow. And that's basically what we did, you know? And I was the primary composer during that era. Um, so it was basically my um vision in a way you know um because and i was really just i needed to do something that was beyond anything i had done before and there was all these signposts up ahead 
weather report. You know, and at some point I become exposed to Don Cherry, you know, and Relativity Sweet, you know, and that's a life changing moment. I hear that record and I'm just like, oh my God, you can actually do all these world music elements and put them together in a cohesive, wonderful way, you know. And I just was trying to emulate or, and, you know, like channel those influences myself in my own way. In my own primitive way, you know, that was the what genesis. Year, what year are we talking about? Um, it began sort of 70, late 73, 74 was when we started. We recorded the first record in 1975 in, uh, was it East Orange, New Jersey? At House of Music, which was the home of disco. <laughs> Now, had you guys seen Mahavishnu? Were you influenced by Mahavishnu? Oh, absolutely. Mahavishnu was huge. We'd seen Weather Report. We'd seen Return to Forever. We'd seen Mahavishnu. Um, I would say Weather Report in my, in my world um, was a little bit ahead of Mahavishnu in terms of influence for me, um, simply because um, I didn't really get what they were doing. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, since who was a guitar player, you know, I mean, John McLaughlin was a guitar player. I could go, oh yeah, okay, I can see this, but holy shit, I'll never be able to play like that in a million years, you know. Um, but I was determined to try, you know. But the element of that Weather Report brought and seeing them live was this free improv thing which which could stop on a dime and, and be in complete control and that to me was so mysterious and so interesting and intriguing that that to this day i think some of those live gigs i saw with weather report are still some of the most amazing performances i've ever seen now this is the group with miroslav eric gravat and you know Joe and Dom Omermao. I never saw them with Ayrto, but Dom Omermao. That, that band was just a mind blowing. And that didn't last very long. That super creative period. I mean, pretty rapidly they went into, you know, the sort of funk thing, which was also great. I saw them during that period. I saw them with Jocko too. And they were an incredible group. But that one period, I didn't really understand what they were doing. And that intrigued me and fascinated me and made me want to dig further into that. And that really was seeing those gigs. I was like, we need to improvise more, you know? And then we saw Oregon and they were doing the same thing. They would do their tunes and then they would do a free improv. And yeah. like, oh, we need to do this more. We need to improv. You know? So we began doing that on, on an almost daily basis. We would do at least one improv. So, but Mahavishnu was hugely important for me. The first time I saw them, Greg, <laughs> I was backstage because my friend promoted the concert, a friend of mine in Chicago promoted the concert. I was backstage. So I basically sp spent the whole time watching Billy Cobham, right? And I, I couldn't believe it. I was just, my, my mind was shattered watching this guy and listening, you know, to what the music was, you know, was going on. But literally, like watching Billy Cobham play at that time was one of the most mind-blowing experiences I've ever had. I couldn't believe it. You know? And fortunately, we got to see them. I got to see them several more times beyond that. And they and every single and they were they were amazing, super influential. You know? Those three groups: Weather Report, Oregon, Mahavishnu. Super important for Shadow Fest. Yeah. And I'm glad you you mentioned the the unique quality of the, the first weather report, including so much free improv, because there's that transition before people start going into more of the funk oriented kind of thing, where even Herbie with M. Wandishi yeah. is doing that. Yeah, yeah, we, that was another record that was super important for M. Wandishi was, we, we poured, we studied that with a microscope. 
that was an amazing group. Yeah. Herbie, yeah, Herbie was obviously super important. Headhunters, yeah. So how is the first release by Shadowfax received? Were you, were you guys uh, well received at that point? Um, no, not, not as far as we knew. We had no idea that, you know, how many records we sold. Critically, we were panned in Chicago, basically. Um, um, and we didn't have any idea that, that we'd sold any amount of records whatsoever. And shortly after that, um, our, our time in the studio recording that record had been so contentious um, that th they dropped us, right? Because the one thing that, that I, I mean, the band was my vision at, at first, and I was really adamant about it. I was very, very adamant about what we were doing. And pretty much everyone in the band kind of had that same attitude. No, we know what we're doing. We don't need you to tell us what to do, you know? And, um, Unfortunately, our producer, we were, we were co-produced by Marty Scott, who was the head of the record company, and he'd never done any production before. And he was horrible. He was, it was awful. But fortunately, we had Larry Fast, who was the guy who would end up being Peter Gabriel's, you know, um, synth guy. And Larry was a fantastic producer. He was incredible. He was great. And eventually he, he told Marty he couldn't come in the studio anymore because we'd had so many screaming matches with him. Where Matt and Mary, Marty would be saying, well, you should do this. And I'm like, no, we're not doing that. You know, and every time Marty did, you know, interact with somebody, it ended up being a disaster, you know, and it would have to be redone. You know? So, but so by the end of it, we, we were kind of, we were cut loose. And we had no idea that the record had any impact whatsoever until years later. And then we go on tour in the eighties and everybody's showing up with their water course way record. Will you sign this? And we're like, wait, you bought this record? <laughs> you know, we thought maybe about, you know, a thousand people bought it, but it sold quite a bit better than that. It was kind of an underground prog hit, you know, prog fusion, jazz, whatever you want to, jazz rock hit, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's what it is in that time period is, first of all, we're, we're sort of retroactively naming all these things uh, because at that time it was just music. Yeah, it was just music. There was no, nobody was calling it Prague. Nobody was calling it um, fusion. Oh, fusion, the fusion word had surfaced a little bit because I remember uh, the poster that they did for our record said music beyond fusion. Oh. So, so fusion that began to surface was beginning to surface. That record came out in 1975. So, yeah, but it wasn't codified. It was, would become later. So what is the, the turning point then for that group, because I know you guys got to be pretty big. Well, the, the, the turning point was actually breaking up for a while. Um, Cause we actually went through our most creative period is the period that no one never, no one ever heard was from 1970, late 76 through 78, where we were a quartet and we didn't have a record contact. We, we were in Chicago and um, just doing music, a lot of improvisation, uh, really wild and woolly compositions that I was writing, very much influenced by some of the ECM people by Mahavishnu McLaughlin. And we were doing medleys of Don Cherry songs at the same time, playing sitar live. You know, we opened for Jack Dijonet's uh, quartet, quintet, and then we opened for Jan Hammer. Um, that was a really great period, but there was literally nowhere to get a record contract because the disco thing hit, right? And there, there was just no way. There was, and it was, became a, like a futile, it seemed completely futile to go on. And two of the members decided they would move to California. And I stayed in Chicago and 
did what I was doing there. And then in 82, Chuck got an offer to do a record for Wyndham Hill, which is when we reformed and became our most successful period in terms of um, audience, you know, and, you know, record sales. You know. That's a very different, almost a different incarnation of the band. Although there are some of the same influences, and a lot of a lot more world music influences in that period are are more obvious during that period. Yeah. So, w at what point are all the exotic instruments coming in and and really? Because uh, I know well, you had told me that you had enough of them on stage that Joe Zawinul was asking you, could he sample that or is this <laughs> or that? Right. We opened, that was in about, that was about in 1985 or something. We opened for Weather Report at the University of Minnesota. And uh, we had a bunch of weird stuff on stage and Joe came out and said, uh, oh, can I sample that? He had a little, really nice little stereo, like, tape recorder. And he was going around sampling everything. And, um, yeah. Well, you know, that was, um, that was Emil Richards sort of opened that, that door. Because on our first record for Wyndham Hill, which we were on a minimal budget, we did that whole record for $30,000. And um, at one point, somehow Chuck and Phil, the bass player, had met Emo. And Emo was a very sweet guy. And for people who don't know Emo, Emo Richards was the first call percussionist for all soundtrack work in Hollywood in that period. He also played with Harry Parch. He was a brilliant, uh, you know, percussionist and musician and just a genius in so many ways. And somehow Chuck convinced him to come and, and play on the record for almost no money. You know, because Emil was like, I mean, there's no way you could afford it, you know, at that time. It was impossible. And he said, well, I'll come and pay you. I'll come and play. You just pay for my cartage which we didn't realize he owned the companies. <laughs> he was making money from it. Um, but anyway, he just, you know, we said, well, we have all these different Indian, African sort of stuff, so bring whatever you think. And he just loaded the studio with percussion gear. And I had one piece that I'd written at the time called Ariki, which was an African influence kind of piece based on um, Dosangoni music, right? And, Emil just went crazy on that piece and did all these amazing things. And we realized, oh, we have to be able to do this live somehow or emulate it or, you know, so we started bringing stuff on the road with us. So, yeah. And basically Emil did that on every session we did. I mean, the second record we did with him, he filled an entire orchestral room with percussion gear, mallets, all the, I mean, it was astounding. It was gongs it was a stone and and on one piece simulated a, a, a gamble on orchestra basically yeah emil was amazing and the th the amazing thing about emil was that uh, i i feel like i should pay him due because he just passed away yeah. last year um i saw him do one of the most talking about amazing learning experiences we had done a track and recorded it in one studio and it was um, at a certain tempo, and then Chuck, who was the composer, decided he wanted to bump it up, right? And then we did overdubs on it. Now, it was never quite right. It never felt right. It felt a little awkward and weird and kind of not locked, you know? And Emil came in, and Chuck said, you know what? I've had this problem with this song, this song is as long as we've done it. And he listened to it. Emil listened to it. He said, let me do something. He went out into the studio with one shaker, one shaker, and he played a shaker through the whole track, just one shaker track, and he locked the whole thing down. It was the most astounding thing I've ever seen. To this day, I don't know how he did it. I, I have to assume that he was basically playing both times simultaneously, you know, but it was... One of those it was like the Willie Dixon paper bag moment where you're just like, oh, holy crap. 
Now this is music. <laughs> and, and then he went on to add layers and layers of marimbas and flapamba and all these different gongs to that track and just turned it into this just magical piece. Yeah. Emil was a treasure. And, and so you guys would just let him go, go or did you ask for certain things from him? Well, you know, we, we let him go. Um, you didn't want to tell Emil that what he was doing was wrong, but we had to occasionally. That was never fun. Um, we, I had one piece on the first record that he played on where it had this tail out and he was playing um, vibe on it. And, um, and he started doing all this jazzy kind of blue note stuff on it, you know, and it just didn't work. You know, it was like not right for the song, you know. And I turned to Chuck, we were in the control room, and I said, do you want to tell him? I don't want to tell him. <laughs> he goes, I'll tell him. I said, it'll be easier. I'll blame you. I'll tell him, but I'll blame you. <laughs> I said, okay. I think Emo always kind of resented me. I said, you know, it, a little bit for that. But, but then the great thing about Emo was, he said, oh. And Chuck said, yeah, you, you can't have any blue notes. I'm like, okay. Emo goes, really? He goes, yeah, no. And then he did another take that was absolutely the most beautiful thing you ever heard. It was astonishing. I mean, he could, Emo was a, a brilliant musician. Yeah. But yeah, we let him go. If you listen to the first Shadow Facts record, Ariki is the name of the song. That's Emo just going crazy, doing whatever he wanted for fun. And us, we imagine us in the control room laughing our asses because <laughs> we were just like, oh my God, listen to that. It sounded yeah. amazing. What's, what was it like dealing with Wyndham Hill? Because, I, you know, a lot of people associate Wyndham Hill with New Age. I should say yeah. New Age. <laughs> new, Age is, new Age is a, a little uh, Alex Klein reference there. But um, the... the the label had George Winston, the label had uh, Alex Degrassi. Right. The label had sort of more, I don't know, what would have been. Well, they had Will Ackerman too, who was that label yeah. head. And it was much more kind of, yeah, soft music kind of, right. Um, in the beginning, it was a little problematic because we were an electric band. Um, and we knew we would have to tone things down. I mean, going from the, you know, rip, rip roaring thing that we had been in the seventies, you know, to this, now we're on basically a label that's never had any, an, I played the first electric guitar on Wind Mill. Uh, Stuart was the first drum set ever recorded for the label. Um, I was the first person to ever use distortion on a guitar for that label, you know? Um, and, you know, it was, it, there were moments where, you know, it was, you'd have to say, no, we have, we're, we're going to have to have this on the record. And they would be like, you know, not happy about it. But eventually they would concede, you know. And that was a, it was a great experience in many ways because Wyndham Hill, I know this is a cliche, but it was a family. It was a very, it was a family owned business. And, um, and, it was, and it was really kind of sweet in a way. I mean, you could call the, com the record company president on the phone and talk to him, you know, and he would take the call, you know, and talk to you, you know. Um, and we had, you know, like lots of good friends who were on that label who were great musicians, like Alex DeGrassi is an incredible musician. Uh, Michael Hedges was an incredible musician. Liz Story was an incredible musician. I mean, these are, I mean, she still is. And I, I, I'm not in touch with any of these folks now, except for Alex DeGrassi. Um, but that, they, these were great musicians. And so it was a, I mean, and then there was also the kind of new age phenomenon of George Winston, who, you know, you know, whatever you can say about that, <laughs> you know, it wasn't my kind of music. I didn't love that kind of music. But, you know, it was, a, it was a, in the beginning, it was a great experience. It was really not without difficulties, but pretty great, you know. I mean, there were times, like, for instance, I wrote a song above the Wailing Wall, which had this very intense Middle Eastern 
dissonant kind of vibe to it. And um, they didn't want it on the record. They thought it was too weird for Wind and Hill. And Chuck, to his credit, said, no, this is going to be on the record. This is absolutely has to be on the record. It, you, you don't get a choice on this. And they, can, and they gave in to Chuck. And it tender, turned out to be a great piece to have on the record. You know, it was, a, you know, so, but they were resistant to doing certain kinds of things because they had an image and a vibe. You know? I mean, they started out being sold in, uh, you know, crystal shops and, you know, like head shops and bookstores. That's where they started, you know, the new age, the whole new age vibe. You know? But there was a lot of great music on that label. I mean, people forget that Billy Childs was on Wendy. There was some great music on there. Now, I think it's also worth noting that Shadow Facts, like Mahavishnu, like to have violin. And you guys had some great violinists in Shadow Facts. Yeah, we did. Um, um, most notably, Jerry Goodman of Mahavishnu, <laughs> which, was a, which was one of the highlights of my time in the band. I love Jerry. I mean, I adored Jerry. I saw Jerry playing in the flock when I lived in Chicago in this, in the, probably around 1969, they were playing in a department store in the mod, in the mod men's clothing department of a department store in Chicago. And I, and I showed up there to buy some corduroy jeans or something. There's flock playing. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> you know, I didn't know who they were, you know, they were, nobody knew they were yet. And, um, so yeah, I mean, and then I, of course, I saw him with Mahavishnu and 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 loved loved Jerry. And then years later, you know, we got him to play in the band. He joined the band for a while, and it was fantastic. I mean, you know, Jerry's an astonishing musician, and by far my favorite violinist in the world. I think his solos are, you know, just. To this day, my favorite violin soloist of all time. When he was playing live and really going for it, I mean, it was just, it was great. It was so much fun. You know? Yeah, we, I mean, being able to trade guitar licks with Jerry Goodman on stage <laughs> was really a blast. Dude. <laughs> it was really a blast. And you guys also had uh, Stephen Kendler, who was in Mod yes, and did right, Yana. Kindler, right. We had seen, actually, oddly enough, we'd see, seen Stephen play with the On Hammer group when we opened for them at the University of Michigan in Ypsilanti years before, during that earlier period. And then later we found out that he was available because uh, our, first, our first violinist, who was also an incredible player, was Jamie Smijinski and who uh, got into a little bit of trouble and left the band. And um, so we got Steven to, to join and he did several tours with us. And Steven is a remarkably great player. He's really good. Uh, I had a lot of fun playing with Steven. Yeah. And then later we had a guy named Charlie Bishrock who was uh, in between there. Yeah. Charlie who was also um, a really good musician. Yeah. So what what is the uh, sort of the end point of of Shadow Facts? How does it how does it go that it becomes something that that you don't want to do anymore? Um, what happened was um, I my my cliched statement on this is that we survived as a band and as a group of friends every adversity that we encountered. The one thing we could not survive was success. And, you know, we started making a lot of money and touring a lot and winning Grammy Awards and um, doing all this stuff that really, and all of it, this is the 80s and it's the era of excess in every way. You know, there's too much money, there's too many drugs, there's too many women, you know, there's too much touring. Um, and it's all going to our heads. I mean, that's the short version. Um, and eventually the record company relationship sours, you know, as Wyndham Hill becomes a legitimate record company. 
and is and they start hiring like LA guys to run the label. And it was awful. It became awful. I mean, here you are trying to justify your existence on the label after you've sold more records than anyone else other than George Winston. I mean, we're the second best selling artist on the label, you know. Every record we put out sold 200,000 copies, you know. And we're trying to rationalize, you know, like why we wanted a certain royalty rate, you know, to these guys and they're not willing to do it. And we were just like, forget that. So we went other places, but that was, it was sort of the beginning of the end. We signed with Capital, that was doomed. You know, because Capital was a nightmare. They didn't understand this. And literally, I mean, it was getting really old to get on the road do the same songs over and over and over again. And I was tired of it, you know. And the creative element was just solely leaking away. There was nothing, there was very little creative going on. You know, we weren't improvising anymore. We wouldn't even improvise. You know, I, I would have these moments, I'd say, well, we, if we're not gonna improvise, then I don't wanna do this anymore. And I would basically, coerce people into improvising just in the, in the studio or in the rehearsal space, but people didn't really want to do it. And you could tell. And you're like, and I was like, okay, well, if you don't want to do this, I want to do it. So I started doing it with other people. And that's when I met Alex Klein. You know, he was the first guy I started improvising with. You know, I met Nels first um, through Adam Rudolph, you know, Nels was working in a record store. Nelson, oh, you should meet my brother because we started talking about music. And he said, you and you and my brother have a lot of the same things in common, shared interest musically. So we got together and I have to say that Alex was so generous because I, my improvising chops at that point were crap. They were, I mean, non-existent. And Alex, I mean, and you, you know, he used to have this massive setup. He brought it to our rehearsal space and set up and jammed with me there. And I, and, and, um, and I, and I, to this day, I think that it was basically, he heard something, you know, and, and uh, it was enough for him that, because I, you know, I was nowhere near where I should have been and where I eventually wanted to be. And, but we started playing together and he, and he said, well, let's do it again. You know, and we did it more and more. And then I started my first group with him. So basically, you know, I got tired. The end for me was getting tired of doing the same music over and over and over and over and over. I felt like a tape recorder, basically. I mean, with, and if you're a successful band like that, that's doing basically composed music, you know, like your moments of stretching out are minimal. You know, you'd have a solo here and there where you get to stretch out. But I, you know, I remembered all those times when we were improvising and how much fun it was and how creatively satisfying it was and how that was, the, that's the wellspring of creativity and improvisation, you know. So, you know, I wanted to do that again. And, and as soon as I started playing with Alex, you know, I realized, oh, I can do this. You know, I can do this with other people. You know, it was a big leap for me, and I just, you know, I left the group. Uh, wh what year did you move to L.A.? 1983. Yeah. So you we were did, doing Shadow Records? We did the first record in 82, and then I moved shortly after that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, clearly, if 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 you're going to go to the LA improvisation scene, you're going to need to to deal with the Klein Bros. Well, you know what's funny is that I did not, I had no idea at the time that meeting Nels was literally kind of this central figure through which you could meet almost every other improvising musician and many other kinds of musicians in in LA. I mean, he was, I mean, everybody knew Nels. And everybody knew what he was doing. And, you know, and he was also like me doing quartet music, which was an improv jazz oriented kind of group, acoustic, but also doing rock music with his bands. 
he was in a band called Rhythm Plague with Stuart Liebig and Wayne Pete, who I would also end up being, you know, comrades with those guys and you know, longtime friends. And also he had a, 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 a rock band called Block that was eventually signed to a record contract. And so he was connected to everybody, almost everyone. And whereas, you know, Alex was very connected to this, this, underground of improv people you know, through Alex I met Vinny and John Fumo and you know all these incredible musicians thankfully yeah so yeah I mean I was so lucky to meet those guys first you know because <laughs> I met everybody through them and they're both astonishing musicians and great people and everyone you're going to meet meet through the Klein brothers are, are great human beings and great musicians you know so I was very lucky, very fortunate that I'm connected to those guys. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was uh, Vinnie Golia that introduced me to Alex. Ah. And, then, and from that point on, it was meeting everybody on the LA scene and yeah. that was doing something creative. Yeah. Um, and it was also uh, refreshing from having been on the New York scene, which was creative, but in a different way. Yeah, uh, I think in a funny way, uh, the LA scene was more open to incorporating the rhythmic ideas of everything, whereas the New York scene was was kind of limited in terms of what was acceptable rhythmically. I think we've yeah. talked about this in the past. You yeah, know? I agree. Yes. So, for what that's worth, obviously, you know, both were cool, and and I. And I was able to to do whatever I wanted pretty much all the time, but um, the G. E. Stinson Quartet is that's the first thing that you're doing outside of uh, having left the whole Shadowfax world. Well, no, that um, actually the quartet was the thing that we started with you. That I started with you. It was the G. E. Stinson group was the one I started with Alex Klein, and Alex basically I had an idea. Of I wanted an upright bass player and Alex was like, Oh, let me introduce you to this guy, Stuart Liebig, you know? And the minute I played with Stuart, I was like, Oh, this, this is automatic. It was totally automatic. And I don't think there's anyone I played with more than Stuart. I've done more projects with Stuart than anyone. Um, and then, you know, I was thinking about a saxophone player and I was, uh, and, and we tried some, you know, playing with saxophone and it didn't really work. And, and Alex said, John Fumo, you know. And the minute I played with Fumo, I was like, oh yeah, perfect. You know, Fumo was a genius, brilliant. I was so lucky to have that group, you know, because I was really kind of finding my way back into that music, you know. And they were, all of them, very, really generous and really open and sort of, yeah, we can do this. Yeah, sure, that's totally cool. And, you know, I first started by introducing compositions and they learned the compositions and that, that was great. And then as we moved on, by the time we started recording the record, we'd been doing just free improvs, you know, a lot. And it was so much fun and so cool. And these guys are great improvisers, you know. So when we got in the studio, I just said, well, let's do, let's do a bunch of improvs, short improvs. I ended up using a bunch of those on the record, yeah. But that was the beginning, my first project after leaving Shadow Facts, yeah. And, and through those guys, I would meet Jeff Gautier too. And then um, we started hanging out and, and eventually started playing the trio with Alex, you know, and Jeff starts cryptogramophone. Our first record with the trio was on Nine Winds, on Vinny's label, yeah. And then at the same time, I was starting to do soundtracks with Vinny. Vinny was, hiring, was working with this director, Jeff Reiner, and he brought us in to do like soundtracks. He'd done all the, and it was so much fun. He had such a blast. It was really fun. And it was basically the, a crew of improvising LA guys doing a soundtrack together. So it was like so much fun. You know, there's an interesting thing about your approach and the way it's changed that I like to call it sound painting. Mm. And I'm wondering when you, 
and where you wouldn't play anything common. Yeah. And I was wondering if that was uh, something that happened at a certain point, what caused that? Because you're such a master of all of the electronics and all of the different uh, uh, agitators and just ways of, of, of exciting the strings. And, and really, uh, all the times that we've played together, I've never heard you play anything normal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate that comment so much. You know, it's so funny because I, every once in a while, I will play, I'll post something online where I'm playing conventional guitar and people will go, other guitar players I know will go, wow, I've never heard you play like guitar guitar before. I said, well, I haven't done it. I don't do it that much. You know, and, and in reality, that's something that's been evolving for since the 60s for me. Although I was never, I never had an outlet to put it out. You know, like the first time I heard extended technique, people will not understand it, is Jeff Beck playing in the yard. Right. And if you listen to those records, you go, oh, there it is. You know, that's the first time I go, what's that what's going on there what look at how he's using sound you know hendrix used sound you know and and these guys go on to do that you know more of that during that period you know that kind of dies away and people start playing more conventional stuff but you know in shadow facts especially in the 80s i wanted to like the other thing is that weather report i was mentioning earlier weather report was really intriguing for me and one of the things i wanted to do back in that early period of shadow effects was how do i get my guitar to sound like joe zollinger's fender Rhodes going through a you know like a ring mod you know a ring modulator or how do i get my my classical guitar to sound like a dosingoni you know and i'm attaching foil now I'm not recording these things. I am recording them at home, but they're not being released in the world. And I'm trying to figure out, well, how do I make this guitar sound like an orchestra, like a string pad or a synth pad? You know, that first starts to surface in, in uh, 82 and 80 yeah, on the first Wyndham Hill record. There's a record, there's a song called Marie, which I wrote, um, which has this first kind of cloudy kind of synth pad orchestral sound you know but that those experiments had been going on all along but then somewhere i am exposed to derek bailey right someone that you know very well knew very well and you know this is another one of those world is shifted the, my sound universe is now completely shifted i'm listening to derek bailey and it's the first record i hear is the duo improvs with anthony braxton right you know that record right sure and i'm just i'm what the hell is he doing <laughs> um, once again what the hell is he doing you know and so i you know it's it's inspiring to me now i don't want to play like bailey i want to do me doing inspired by bailey so i start doing all this other stuff you know putting objects on the string. And then uh, somebody in the 80s turns me on to Fred Fritz's first record, you know? And I, I'm already halfway there and I hear, oh, alligator clips, wow, that's cool. You know, and Nelson and I are basically kind of, I think it might've been, no, it was, I don't remember who turned me on to that record, but it might've been my buddy, Greg Aragine, who was another incredible musician who's passed away, but um, yeah. I mean, so, you know, but I always also had that massive ECM damage, right? That, that's the other, the other element of this that has been left out of this discussion so far is how much the ECM sound and those musicians influenced us. You know, and it's not, in the early Shadow Fact stuff, it's not really that obvious, but it's there in terms of like, a sense of exploration, uh, using sound, and and later on it becomes much more, you know, like Eberhard Weber and Terry Reepdahl and Leon Garberek, all these guys, and what they're doing using and Monfred Eicher using the studio space to create this kind of atmospheric 
vibe. Now, I totally am in love with that world, you know, and, you know, I go out and buy all sorts of lexicon gear, basically, and traveling with it, you know, the shadow effects era, I didn't get to use it because we were not doing music like that. But when I'm home, that's all I'm doing. I'm making soundscapes. That's all I'm doing. You know, soundscapes, looping, you know. And uh, so, you know, the first chances I get to do that, you know, in any real sense is the GE Stinson group. And then later with other bands like Bone Structure, like the group that we did. And with, um, the trio with Alex and Jeff, that's when it really sort of comes into its own in terms of, I mean, I've been doing that for a long time. Al, Nelson and I had been doing tons of duo live gigs, but none of it was ever recorded. You know? So with the trio with Alex and Jeff, that's all these massive soundscapes you know, and uh, extended technique and dental tools on the guitar and paintbrushes and things like that, yeah. which is my world now. You know, I love that world. It's a beautiful world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that we both come from the conventional crossing into the post-conventional, yeah. in the words of Doug Lon, um, oh. you know, that we were, you know, conventional to post-conventional, and then it, you know, in my case, it was Jamie Muir from King Crimson and Music Improvisation Company with Derek, obviously. And just saying, what is, what is he playing? What, what, are, what is that? Is that a screen door? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. So, so I think Altschul. that was... Barry Altschul, okay. Barry Altschul. Yeah, I mean, people are going to see that I, I did a, I have recorded a, a discussion here with Alex Klein, and, and we list Barry Altschul among our guys. Uh, but certainly, um, at a certain point when you fall in love with sounds. Yeah. And it's no longer uh, sort of the decoration, but it's actually the meal. Yeah. You no. Know? Well, you know, you know, going back to like the art ensemble, that's really a key element, which I didn't really get at first, but now, now I, see, I realize, oh yes, this is a cross fertilization. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't a percussionist. I was a guitar player, but the, the seed is being sown there when you're listening to these records and you're hearing all these sound elements. And like you listen to people in sorrow now, I mean, you have to think, remember this recorded in 1969 and it's pure sound. I mean, it's just sound and that's an astonishing thing. And I, you know, like, so you have to sort of give them credit for that soundscape kind of like what you're talking about. This is the meal. We're not, don't wait for the head. The head's not coming. This is it here. You know, the, this is the whole deal right here. Yeah. It's an openness that's, you know. And also, it should be said that you and I are both very visual guys. Yeah. And you're married to a visual artist. Yeah. I'm clearly enamored of the visual <laughs> world. So, you know, we, at that, I, I think it's, it's fair to say that that's another influence where we're saying, well, you know, art is music, music is an art form, and we're going to paint with sound absolutely there, there's no question about it um yeah i mean i think that i don't know how to the other thing about this is like growing up in a period both of us com coming of age in a period when there was a lot of experimentation going on in every kind of art form in 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 uh visual art in cinematic ways you know um i, I mean all of the films that you begin to see when we're at a very formative age, you know, and, and the, the, the visuals are changing radically, you know, and you're seeing all these amazing things. This is altering how you interact with the world. And it's not, you know, it's like, you know, it's not separate. It's all a whole thing, you know, absolutely. And I, I love, I love still love doing 
interactions with visual artists, especially people who are doing video art. Like I still do that all the time. Like one of my, I'd much rather have someone doing video art while I'm playing than just be up there by myself. You know, it's much more interesting. I, I think that looking at me while I'm creating soundscapes is maybe not that interesting. You know, maybe for nerds it would be. <laughs> But, you know, if you have like this beautiful or amazing or revolutionary, you know, visual landscape going on or visual scape going on at the same time, it's really interesting, you know, really fun, and very satisfying. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for me also, Stan Brackage, the filmmaker, was a huge revolution. Absolutely. Thumbs up. Let me get in there. Yes. Yeah, Stan Brackage, man. Amazing. You know, totally amazing. Yeah, really great stuff. I, I had a solo percussion piece pretty early on when I started playing solo percussion concerts that was uh, very much influenced by his approach in terms of um, microphonics. So if you were thinking about like how he would get into the gritty detail of surfaces where it'd be unrecognizable what the object was. Well, I thought, well, what if we could do that with sounds yeah. by heavily amplifying really small sounds? Now, this right. was not something that I invented. Uh, I was influenced by Stockhausen and particularly Hugh Davies, who right. was in a music improvisation company with Derek and Jamie, um, right. who worked with Stockhausen. Uh, so that, that whole idea of, um, of, of, of taking sounds and treating them to the point that they were not recognizable led to my uh, doing a lot of extended techniques for percussion where uh, it wasn't about striking. It could be about bowing. It could be about scraping, yeah. rubbing. So, uh, so we hey, have great. Can we have a break. Yes. All right. Pause. Pausing. Yeah. So I, I feel like we had shared that, it was an easy fit for you, me, and Jeff, and, and Stuart. And uh, we're going to do uh, a separate panel uh, discussion for bone structure. I'm right. looking forward to that, uh, getting the guys together and talking about what all that madness was. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but tell me a little bit about, uh, about what you've been up to lately, because I know that you're always creating and you're always – trying new things uh in fact um i've heard some things that you've done recently where you're singing yeah um well th that's been an element of what i've done for many years but more recently i've i've tried to do i've brought it back in to certain things and i'm you know like um most people don't know this about me but i've been hired you know to do vocals for you know like cinema stuff and uh, different um, like sound libraries and things like that. Um, lots of times it'll be for the low gruff thing, but sometimes it's for other things, uh, you know, like, like sort of English goth stuff too, you know, because I am a baritone or I have a low voice, so that kind of fits in. Yeah, but uh, so I've done that. I've been doing a lot of that and having a lot of fun with it too. I love working, I love writing songs. I love like doing underground pop stuff. Um, you know, and I've had projects with different singers and I'm still doing tons of improv as well. I mean, the, before all the quarantine things started, I was doing a series of um, gigs at um, a space downtown called Coaxial, where I would basically put a kind of loose group of, improvisers together usually there was some format like and it'd be like trio trio you know sextet or duo duo trio trio sextet something like that you know? and it would be any anyone from you know all the usual suspects Vinny was involved john was involved fumo was involved stuart liebig sarah bell reed i don't know if you know her she's this incredible trumpet and electronic player um, doing extended technique on trumpet and a lot of electronics, really, really cool stuff. Miller Wren doing upright bass and um, Brian Christopherson playing drums. Um, so a lot of that and doing just tons of recording for myself and also for, you know, like whatever 
um, film and soundtrack work I might be working on at any given moment. Who knows? Yeah. But singing, yeah. I like to sing. <laughs> well, there's a vocal on the very first Shadow Facts record. Oh, yeah. Huh. Yeah, it's a, a true prog treasure, that one. <laughs> One of the a song a song that I wrote a composition I wrote that was so difficult to perform had so many different changing time signatures that we never really ever did it out live because because it was just too difficult. Um, you know, I think we might have done it once live, and then I kind of got sick. And I kind of burned out on singing anyway. I go through periods where I don't want to sing. I just want to play. You know, I've been kind of always like that. But you were doing a, a tribute project that I loved a few years ago where you, you sang uh, a tribute to David Bowie. Oh, yeah. That was the, um, I did, yeah, that started because, you know, it started when he died. And um, I have a love of Bowie that's kind of weird in a, in a way, okay? Because most people who know Bowie and love Bowie go back to the Ziggy Stardust days. And they fell in love with him there and they loved him there. You know, and then it grew from there. And to be honest with you, he and I are of a similar age group, you know, and we had a lot of the same influences. I remember reading about him and I would hear the music and go, oh, he's been listening to the Yardbirds, you know. And so his early stuff didn't really interest me that much. I, I thought it was like, yeah, whatever, I've heard, kind of heard this before. And the visual thing was not a big element for me, not a key element. So I really came to him later, like ashes to ashes, period. And then beyond that, I really latched on to him as he began to go into places where most people didn't, weren't interested in following him. You know, he, get, he went into like, and you know, he, his pop period is one thing. I'm not so in love with that. But after that, and he, he went into drum and bass and super electronic stuff and really like some very, very cool stuff. And most of the Bowie fans I knew were not listening to him. I was so into that period of Bowie, the later period. And I really felt like the last record he did, you know, was the, one of the greatest records ever recorded. There's no question in my mind. It's Black and, Star? Yeah, I, and I think a lot of people don't get the record, the, like the traditional Bowie fans, you know, who love Ziggy Stardust, it's too weird, it's too dark, it's whatever. I think it's an absolute genius artistic yeah. achievement. And to think about the fact that it was being done as he was dying, and he knew he was dying, it's, it's astounding. So when he died, I was shattered. It really, it really shattered me. I mean, I was really upset. I mean, I can... The only other time I can remember being as upset was when George Harrison died. <laughs> when George Harrison died, I was really upset because I love George Harrison. And speaking of someone who should be acknowledged for all of the, being the first major sort of pivotal world music influence in my life, it has to be George Harrison. So, I mean, when Bowie dies and I just, I decided I wanted to do a tribute song for him, you know, and, I'll be honest with you, I kind of shocked myself when I got it done. I listened to it back and I'm like, wow, this is kind of pretty amazing. <laughs> you know, I was kind of surprised by how well it turned out. And I sent it to Nels and I sent it to Yuka, Honda, Nels's wife, and a lot of other friends. And they were like, holy crap, man, this is really a great song. And so I just decided to keep on doing what I call like homages to people I love, living and dead, you know? And I just continued to do that. So I did a whole record of songs. Basically I did a song for three of the guys from Shadow Facts who had passed since passed. I did one for my mother who is living, and one for my father who's passed. I did, and then others for other people, you know, that I love and adore. So yeah, and they're all songs and all quite different. And I got different people to come in and play on them. Stuart played on some, on one of them. Um, other people came in and played on them, yeah. Where can I, people find it, those? Sorry, say again? Where can people find those? 
Those are on Bandcamp, under, listed under, under the name Fragment X. That's where they are. I highly recommend them if, if you want to hear what GE's up to more or less recently. Uh, are there other things up on your Bandcamp there? There are tons of things. That, that's notable. Uh, the other one that I think is, would be interesting to people who are who are no are familiar with me as an improviser and a member of Shadow Facts is the group that I put together called a sort of loose it's called Ghost Aggregate. And the name implies what it is. It's a it's a virtual aggregate of human beings that uh did I constructed I did what I I constructed improvisations using um the tools that I know that I've learned to use on the computer through doing soundtracks. And I created these tracks and invited people to come and play on them. And I also did, you know, tributes. I did a tribute to Joseph Jarman on one of those. And Vinnie Golia plays on it. Philip Greenleaf plays on it. Stewart plays on it. Miller Wren plays on it. And it's one of the, the, the things that I'm most proud of in recent years because it's really hard to get the feeling of people actually improvising in a, in a computer setting. It's very difficult to do. And I actually think I did a pretty good job, you know. And the tough part is, um, is doing the, the percussion and the, the drums, you know, because that's, it's a to get a humanistic feel is really difficult in a computer. But I learned a lot doing a soundtrack <laughs> um, where I had to emulate different drummers. And the one I learned most from was Keith Moon. <laughs> and Mitch Mitchell. Because I had to emulate their drum style on a computer. So I'd never done this. Have you ever sat down and sort of tried to analyze Keith Dr Moon's drumming? I never had. I never had. So I, I had to do a song that had, was in that style. So I had to like sit down and figure out how Keith Moon did what he did and what it was. And it was very enlightening because, you know, his time was very fluid. He had a very fluid sense of time, which a lot of those drummers did in the 60s and 70s. They had a very fluid sense of time. Mitch Mitchell was pretty much, he had a very fluid sense of time too. So I had to figure out, and literally I went in and would, you know, like there's in a computer, there's a grid, everything's locked down on a grid. You just move things off the grid, but you have to, it's painstaking process because you have to literally do every single note differently because that's how humans play, right? But you can actually emulate human playing by doing this. Now they have features on computers now to humanize, right? And it randomly changes the time, you know, on different notes. But it's much better to go in because, and do it manually because if you have a piece of a period of a, I mean, a section of an improv that feels like it's lifting, the players are lifting the time. You want to go in and lift the drums too. The, the percussion elements, all those elements, all those, um, virtual elements also have to be changed to, to, meet, to meet that feeling of lifting or, or relaxing, you know. You know, so I, I did that and it was crazy, <laughs> an insane thing to do. But when I was done, I was like, wow, this is, turned out pretty good, pretty cool. Yeah. So it was fun. Ghost Aggregate. That's also on, uh, I think that's on my page, G.E. Stinson page. Yeah. GE, I feel like we could go on and on. We've been at it for a little bit here. Yeah, but I think that's long enough, isn't it? <laughs> I, think, I think it's long enough for now. We're, we're definitely going to reconvene for the bone structure discussion with Jeff and Stuart. Right. I'll let them do most of the talking. <laughs> Since I've already had my time. But, but that's, I, a, I want... that's a whole different, that's a fascinating subject because that band was such an interesting uh configuration of human beings coming together 
for that project. That was a, yeah. And with some very challenging physical limitations, if you recall the recording, losing the master tapes and all that stuff. That's, wow. <laughs> oh, I remember. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, so we'll cover all of that, but, but thank you so much for taking the time to share. Of course, it was uh, great fun. Good to talk to you, buddy. And um, nice I see that you're doing this stuff. Very cool. Yeah, and, and there's more to come. And uh, thank you for watching, everyone. And please like and subscribe, if you will. And we'll keep doing this with all the most interesting people, just like G.E. Stinson here. And uh, GE, I hope that we get to make music in person again sometime soon. Yeah, sometime soon, I hope. Let's, let's make that happen. All right, All right, buddy. Cool. Good to see you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.